Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 46 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Cannoli Fingers. <laughs> I'm joined here by my enamored co-host, former market maker of 20 years and current day retail trader, a notorious paper hanger, well known in his day for the retail trading money that he took. But now, retail traders are quoting him like the holy book. I'm talking about the House Street own Houdini. JJ, how's it going? Hey, Rhea. Good, brother. How are you today? I'm doing good, man. Doing real good. And our guest today is one of my favorite people in the trading community, founder and CEO of the Wall Street Coach. For over a decade, she has coached clients ranging from high-ranking executives and traders from companies such as Anchorage Capital, Bank of America, Barron's, Blackstone, Credit Suisse, L'Oreal, and NBC, just to name a few. Author of Transforming Wall Street and a co-host of the Popular Steady Trade podcast. I am talking about none other than Kim and Curtin. Kim, how's it going? It's going great, Ray. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome. So glad you came on. And you know, I, I say you're one of my uh, favorite people in the trading community as we've got to know each other. Uh, over these past few months as I've been working with you. Now, you know, I'm sure everyone's like sessions, uh, individual sessions are different, but you know, rarely do you and I actually talk trading directly. So how have you helped me improve my trading if we don't like directly talk about it? You know, I think part of what's fascinating about trading is that how, what your relationship to yourself, the self side of a trader it informs his work side. So I think if you get the ducks in a row and or turn the volume down on the inner saboteurs, uh, how can that not benefit somebody's uh, output of work, whether it's trading or any kind of uh, business pursuit? If you're hindered in some way internally, uh, how can that hindering not impact all of you. I feel part of the misnomer is that who we are professionally or who we are as a trader is somehow separate from who we are uh, as a human being. And I don't think that's true. I, I see it as a spider web and the spider webs always interconnected. We, we are interconnected and it all informs it, itself. So it's a long answer, but that's my answer. No, absolutely. It's, a, it's such a fascinating uh, concept to me um, and I think to others too because uh, people don't grasp that right it's like how can I get better at trading if we don't actually talk about trading but I think it goes to um, overall well-being like taking care of yourself and also like what we're doing like risking money is bringing out our own demons and yes. it's going to bubble things to the surface that are probably bubble up in your you know everyday life as well Lovely. Um, so Hopefully. yeah, yeah. And, and the question is, right. You know, I, I kind of want to say to you is like, is, has your trading improved since we've spoken? Because that, that's where the rubber meets the road. Like, yeah. okay, maybe we're not talking about trading, but is, if trading has trading changed. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've been steadily getting more profitable, uh, more consistent. And I, I don't think it's a coincidence uh, at all. I mean, I, I just, you know, during the day, I, I feel so present. Um, mm -hmm. Even even if I have losing days, or you know, I, I'm always going to feel some negative thoughts creeping up, but I'm able to dismiss them. Boom, stay focused on for the next trade. If it was a losing one, etc. So no, I, I don't think it's no no coincidence, and I 100% believe in that concept. Like uh, absolutely. So you know, I, I, I thank you. It's, it's been a, a great help for sure. That's so. great. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. I think you know the the concept of like the thoughts. The negative thoughts come, uh, the judgments come, uh, the resistance comes, and then you put it down, right? So I think the key is realizing we're human, we're going to have sec second guessing ourselves, we're going to have judgmental thoughts, and then how fast do they come up and do we let them go? Right. That is in the, and when we shorten the distance uh, over time, it almost becomes like, a flow state where you're like, oh, there's those thoughts. 
and then you drop them and then you go back to the flow state. And mm -hmm. I think about what they, the phrase water off a duck's back. Why do they, what's that phrase about? Well, there's like a film, a coating on the back of a duck that allows the water to just not, you know, to bead right off. And that's what I feel self-development coaching facilitates for people. It kind of creates this layer that allows the water to, to not stay, but to just slide right off. And the water being, you know, a metaphor for doubt and or, you know, hindrance, self-hindrance or the inner gremlin or the inner saboteur. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I'm a, a big advocate of meditating and like that's really I think helps my practice of that in my everyday life right it's like okay like those thoughts are going to come up but how quickly do you recognize it let it go okay back yeah. and um yeah not identify with them not yeah. identify and not, you know I think people that try meditation they say oh it didn't work for me as if it like is something that stays and never goes away like a light switch that turns on it's like it's not like that. It's like, it's not working. Is it's working? <laughs> you know? yeah, I, I almost think of it kind of like, uh, like working out, right? Like if you stop working out, your muscles going to atrophy, right? Absolutely. So it, Absolutely. You think keep it going. So just reminded to the listeners, if you guys want to learn market auction theory, market profile, trade futures, trade equities, join JJ and I at our lovely trading community at microefutures.com. Tim, you haven't been a coach your whole career. Tell us what you did before and what led to you becoming a coach. I pr previously was an executive and personal assistant, chief of staff, if you will, uh, at a hedge fund. I was working in finance for 10 years. Uh, prior, I was with two different hedge funds over the years. And then prior to that, I also worked for community bankers uh, of New York State. So again, in a, a C-suite level role as an executive assistant. So I actually, I was at the top of my game when I uh, decided to start my own coaching practice, I hired a coach. Uh, but before I hired a coach, I did something called Landmark, Landmark Education, which uh, was known back in the 70s as EST. And they kind of rebranded it because they got, you know, kind of demonized by some people that just wanted to kind of drive it into the ground. So I wound up doing Landmark. A friend of mine had told me about it and it kind of blew my mind away. Uh, I think I had an interesting childhood. I'll say that. There's more to get into another time, but it was interesting at a minimum. And I definitely think that I was coming from a place in my young adulthood, uh, sort of seeing myself as a victim of circumstance and uh, not really feeling empowered. And after Landmark, Landmark kind of just took my whole plane of vision and shifted it 180 degrees. And in the course, they talk about early poppers and late poppers. And I was definitely a late popper because I was really committed to the story that I had written for myself, the victim that I saw myself as having been of my life and circumstance. And when I came out of that course, I really got that that was a story I was uh, somehow committed to. And the question they posed to me ultimately was, if you are not this story, just consider that, if you're not this story, who might you be? And that was like a mind blowing opportunity for me to step out of the story and rewrite a new story. And at that moment, I feel like it gave me my life back. It gave me back pure possibility. And then I was like, wow, if I get to write this story, what is it gonna say? And so from that point on, I became really committed uh, to getting a lot of that story out of my way, the old story. And that's when I hired a coach. So I was uh, at a hedge fund at the time. I, I was at the top of my game, certainly salary wise, bonus wise. Uh, and even though it was incredibly challenging and it was like, you know, 
playing seven chess boards every day and everything had to be perfect. You know, the finance world, it's no mistakes, perfect the first time. And, you know, 14 hour days, plus I had a Blackberry back then, you know, and like I slept with my Blackberry. I don't know if you did, Jay, but I slept with my Blackberry because my had, boss needed something at 2 a.m. <laughs> I, had, I, I had three of them. You did? Oh my God. They wanted me to have a second one. And I was like, no, I can barely have one. I had, yeah, one for Europe, one for Asia, one for North America. And, oh, uh, dude. Uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just, you, you just, your life becomes that damn phone. Correct, you know, correct. I, I, yeah, I had PTSD. I, just, uh, listen, I had PTSD I from red blinking lights for like at least yeah. 10 years. Because when you see that light. A, a black, <laughs> I still have a Blackberry thumb that like still yeah. shakes. <laughs> when you see that light. Right? You know that light, you know it's usually not good, right? It's usually it's not like good. two in the morning, that light's going off, you're like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. god. Oh, yeah. So much, so much trauma. And and, and like it I I definitely I love the strategy aspect of it. I loved, you know, working with real, the smartest people in the world. Like mm -hmm. it's the, it's the most the smartest people in the world. And I was very fortunate because I really was fortunate over 10 years, I worked with really good people. So I never was up against, you know, harrowing situations. I mean, I definitely have a few stories, but the point is like, it was, I was never, um, so, so all that was exciting and exhilarating, but I also, as a little girl, even, there was a part of me that knew I was here for more and I didn't know what that was. And I also had seen Joseph Campbell uh, in my early twenties, his, uh, series the power of myth he talked about finding your bliss and i had really been on the hunt for my bliss since seeing campbell you know in my 20s so there was a part of me that knew okay uh i'm not living my bliss i like what i do i'm definitely challenged i'm certainly compensated well but this is not my bliss what the hell is it i have been looking for years i did landmark hired this coach and when i hired the coach a coach that I hired Kate Roski. Shout out to you, Kate. Uh, she was a certified coach from the Coaches Training Institute. And I literally can remember sitting with her at the Dean and DeLuca uh, coffee shop in Bar uh, Borders Books and Music in the Time Warner Center, Columbus Circle. So vivid to this day. And this is 15 years ago. And she started to talk about coaching and how it was so different than therapy and what my experience with her might be like. And as soon as she started to talk about the context in which coaches work, I am not kidding you. It was like the heavens opened and the angels sang. And I instantly was like shot with a lightning bolt that said, this is it. This is it. And I can remember working with her maybe a month in and I was like, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. And I, I let, when I left my hedge fund, you know, there was like, I don't know, 70 people. I, I walked around. I remember giving my notice and everybody's like, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, you know, like, are you crazy? You're like, you don't walk away from this position. And I was just like, I'm going to start my coaching firm. And they're like, how are you going to do that? I'm like, I have no idea, <laughs> but this is what I'm born to do. And they were like, okay, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> crazy, crazy wow. motherfucker. <laughs> is it okay to curse? I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't it's ask, okay. But, okay. It's, okay. It's a hedge fund. What else are they going to say? Exactly. That's exactly how you talk when you're on a desk. <laughs> okay, lunatic lady. What the fuck happened to her in a freaking landmark course? <laughs> when, when you're talking about being committed to your story, Tim, I've heard, and I, and I forget who I heard quote this. They, they say, for an individual, you want to give yourself as least amount of labels as possible on like who you are. You, you agree with that statement? I guess what the idea is, it, it leaves yourself comfortable yeah. to find yourself. Uh, what, what would you say to that? I think it's a really great, uh, it probably helps people understand. Like, like on one hand, I'm torn about that statement because I think at the beginning of one's personal quest or heroic journey, if you will, you, you need to sort of give yourself a label or two beyond what the labels have been laid upon you by your family of origin, right? You, you have to sort of, you, we come into this world labeled. 
I'm, you know, Irish, I'm Catholic, I'm Christian, I'm uh, a girl, I'm blonde, you know, like we have all these labels that kind of get laid upon us. And, and then we have to kind of rewrite the labels. Like, oh, well, uh, maybe I'm thoughtful or I'm empathetic, right? So it starts the process of transcending those labels. And, and then, yes, I do believe ultimately you, you want to come to a place of not having any of those labels adhere to you and, and not see them at least as your identity. Like, cause they're not, like, I'm not, I'm not the labels uh, that I potentially have for myself or that others have for me. I'm, I'm so much more than that. You're so much more than that. And I think the labels can, in a sense, become a bit of a prison, especially if we start to compare ourselves to other people. I also, you know, Joseph Campbell is a huge mentor of mine. He talks also about the tendency of our cultures to teach us that another person is an it, if you will. And the other phrase that I, I've heard used that helps is we have a tendency to otherize people that are different than us. And so, and, and we otherize ourselves as well, you know? And I think it's the otherization or the it factor that keeps us away. He, he's an advocate, Campbell, of seeing another human being, including yourself, as a thou. And he said, when we see ourselves as a thou, we, we come with reverence. If we're dealing with another human being and we treat them as a thou, we treat them with a different level of uh, connection and reverence. But if we otherize somebody, including ourselves, or make somebody an it, you know, we're just not going to treat them with that same sort of respect. Right, right. Absolutely. Powerful stuff. Kim, like you're saying, when, when you made that jump to quit the job, I, I, I imagine that wasn't an easy decision. How, where did you get that conviction? And yeah, what, what just made you do that leap? I, it was just knowing that I had been looking for that bliss that Campbell talked about. I, I understood what he meant when he talked about finding the bliss. And yet, you know, I had looked for it. I was 40 years old uh, when coaching showed up in my life. And, you know, that was 20 years of looking for that damn bliss. Like most people didn't even know what the hell bliss was. Here I knew about it from my 20s and I still couldn't find it. What the hell? Like it felt really frustrating and like I was, you know, going down a bunch of dead ends. And then here I am, you know, making great money at the top of the game, all that crap, you know, going to dinner. I mean, look, the, the benefit to lots of money is you go to the best restaurants, you get to wear the beautiful clothes, you get to not have to count your pennies to buy a $40 lipstick. Like all that shit is wonderful. I love that. And there was a part of me that was like completely not fully satisfied with what I was doing. So when that opportunity came, it, it, was, it was like I didn't have a choice in a way because it just felt like home. I knew that that bliss, that sense of contribution that I was born to be for other people uh, and my own journey to be whole, it was kind of calling me forth. You know, what they say about coaching is that you, happen, you coach other people on the very things that you wind up have to work on yourself. So it just becomes this like kind of beautiful uh, cyclical experience. Yeah. And, um, but I, but I also was very fortunate cause, uh, a very, the man I dedicate my book to actually, uh, father Tom, uh, he was a really influential human being in my life. Uh, six months after I started my business, I got a call from a headhunter with a temptation of like temptations. It was, you know, Oh, crazy salary base, uh, managing a very high-end art collection of this man, chief of staff, voice of the table, flying around on his private jet all over the world. Like, it was the dream, you know, wet dream of an executive assistant chief of staff. Like, like oh my God, kill me now. This is like the most unbelievable position. And to have a real voice at the table, right? And I was just horrified. I was so mad at her for calling me because I was like, are you kidding me? I just started my own business. And I called Father Tom and I was hysterical. I was like, here's this opportunity. It's so much money. 
la la la, how do I say no to this? But I just started my business. What do I do? And he was, he just, I remember the pause lasted like five minutes, you know, I was like, oh my God, what's he going to say? And then I heard myself hoping, hoping he would say, stick with what I wanted to do. Uh, and that told me something too. It's always a good thing is if you're asking somebody's advice, see which one you're hoping they'll say, because that's telling you what you really want, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, and then he just said, Kim, I think you need to follow your heart. And I just like broke down and I was like, that's what I really want to do is follow my heart. So yes, it was a very, but I'll, I'll tell you, Ray, over all these years of being a coach, it's been hard, like financially creating a business. Like it's just been such a roller coaster that I can't say I never look back at that moment and think, should I have gone in there and made a couple, you know, made some more money to just fund me more? <laughs> yeah. But I know that I made the right choice. But, you know, in the hard times and the times when the big contract doesn't come through, yeah. you know, you're like, oh, what the hell, man? Right, right. I, and, no, you know, I, I, I can sympathize. Like, even though our experiences are on the surface are way different, I, I can totally relate and sympathize to what you felt, you know, like, and, you know, on a smaller scale, like I was working a sales job while I was playing poker and, you know, having a son too, it's like, I had to think twice about like, okay, do I just want to play poker as my career and making that leap to that was uh, a scary, like, yeah, real scary thing, you know, and, and it was stressful. It wasn't always, you know, glitz and glamor while I was doing it, yep, but that's it. what, yeah. that what was inside of me. And I was like, no, like, this is what, this is the choice I need to make. I need to, you know, follow the bliss, right? Totally. Right, totally. right. Totally. So, and, mm -hmm. and they say, you know, he says that when you follow your bliss, uh, doors will open where there once were only walls. Yeah. It's like you yeah. have to leap and, and then the net appears. And it's kind of screwed up that that's the way it has to play out. But I feel like, I, th I feel it was a heroic journey. Like we're, I believe truly we all are on a hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And those calls that we get, you know, we can answer the call or we can say no. And uh, I said, yes, you know, and uh, it's made all the difference, you yeah. know, to, to say yes to the adventure. Absolutely. So you said yes too. And that's probably why, you know, we hit it off, right? Because we both said yes to our prospective heroes adventure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Um, I believe this was early in your coaching career, Kim. Um, and I, and I love the photo. It's, it's the picture of you outside the, the New York stock exchange holding a sign offering free coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one, I love the hustle. I love the, you know, <laughs> just the creativity of it. Um, th this was during the, the crash, right? In 08? Yeah, 08. Tell, tell us I, behind this. What, what made you do that? Uh, you know, uh, there was a guy running around at the time called One Man. He was doing a free hugs movement. And uh, he started in Australia. And I, you know, started to create a free hugs movement in New York. So I did it by myself initially. And then every year I did it on the Sunday after Thanksgiving uh, in Columbus Circle because we thought, oh, that's like a hug. And I had like a group of people that would come with me and we'd just give out free hugs. So the summer of 08, it was like August, I was coming back from Jones Beach crying on my friend's shoulder about not having enough business. I was a year, I was a year and a half into starting my practice. So a year and a half into getting clients, the 08, you know, before the 08 crash, crash came uh, a month or two before, like it was already begun, you know, so, so all of a sudden I had clients like I, I was okay you know but but men went like this and I was it really went down and I was like oh shit what have I done I've walked away from a crazy good salary like oh my god I'm freaking out so I'm freaking out to my friend and she says you know that free hugs thing you do Kim what if you did free coaching I know it sounds crazy but what do you think I was like that's insane I'm like Huh. And then I thought of Lucy in, in the uh, peanut strip where she does the doctor is in. And I was like, you know, I'm desperate. I got to do something. I'm going to have to start getting some temp work. Like maybe, maybe that'll work. So I thought, okay, where should I do this? And I thought, damn, Wall Street's hard on a good day. Never mind now. It must be <laughs> hell. So I thought, ah, let's go sit out there. So the first day I sat there, Ray. Mm -hmm. was October 7th, 2008. That's the date to market crash 500 <laughs> points. Wow. 
So I was out there and, you know, like I had no idea what was going on inside. And then, you know, the traders were coming out from the floor and uh, they they all just looked like horrified and shell shocked. And I was like, what's going on? And they were like, the market's in free fall. And then, you know, I just kept going back, going back at lunchtime. A couple, you know, if it rained, I didn't go, but it was, you know, still September. So it wasn't cold. And then a couple of weeks into it, everybody was covering the collapse of Wall Street. This is back in 08, right? And uh, a reporter came and he wound up covering my story. Eight reporters in the end interviewed me, but one reporter spoke about me in his article, calling me the Wall Street coach. And I was like, hey, that is a damn good name. And I ran to GoDaddy and I was like, the Wall Street coach that comes, anybody have that? They must have that. Nobody had it. $8.50 later, nice. the brand was born. I love it. I love it. And now I've copywritten it, of course, now. So yeah. that's how, that's how. So it just goes to prove, you know, I, I was just unabashedly committed. There was no plan B. So like going out there, was I nervous? Of course I was. Did I feel foolish and ashamed? Of course I did. But I was like, this is it. Like I have to fucking make this work if it means even going down in flames. Like right. I'm born to do this. I'll do it for free I have, if I have to. Um, yeah, right. that's what happened. All right, well, well, I mean, that's the thing too, right? It's like you, if, if you made the decision it's like you have to go full force. Uh, being hesitant and half-assed is probably the worst thing you can totally. do, right? Totally. Right. Totally. Now, now, Kimmy, I mean, you said it, this, you know, this whole time you coach and it always, you know, it hasn't been, you know, it's got its ups and downs. It has, you know, it's bumps and bruises. You know, I'd imagine though, like doing these things, you've gone through a lot of growth yourself personally. Can, can you speak to that? You know, I think part of what's remarkable about coaching is that it doesn't ever ask you, you can't, you can't ask a client to go someplace that you yourself as a coach have not been willing to go. Mm. So if there are dragons that you as a coach have not faced or wrestled with, then, that, you know, when people ask me if, if you know, Kim, if I'm looking for a coach, what do I want to find? You know, let's say somebody can't work with me because my price is not set for them. And they'll say like, what do, who do, what do I want to look for in a coach? You know, yes, it's nice to have somebody certified, but I would say more important than even a certification is has that person been with their own dragons? Have they been to the dark basement of their own soul and been with the hard to be with shit. And if they haven't, then really rethink whether that is the coach you want to work for or work with, so to speak. So I think if there's one thing I'm completely confident in is I have never chosen uh, comfort over truth. I'm always willing to be with the hard truths about myself I've always been curious about how I potentially could not, could, could transcend that which holds me back. And that is not everybody's style and that's okay. I have no judgment if that's somebody, not somebody's style, but I'm of the opinion that like at the end of the day, the coach needs to have been willing to be that courageous, to be with all those scary things so that you can potentially accompany your client. And I remember when I first, you know, was in the process of getting uh, through my training, uh, you know, I wound up being with, uh, you know, a cab driver who was like, oh, I definitely want to be coached on, you know, this. And I was like, great, like, I'll do a sample session with you. You know, I was so excited to coach everybody and anybody I could. Um, and then he came to the call with something radically different radically intense, radically intimidating to me. And I remember thinking, wow, sometimes people will come to the table telling me they're coming for X and then something completely different will show up. Mm -hmm. And I was humble, 
enough in that moment, you know, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm just trying to say, like, I knew that what he wanted to work on was way beyond my league that moment. You know, I was like two minutes, uh, a coach. And I thought, whew, that is something I'm not, I'm not ready to take on for myself, never mind for this man. So I got him a coach that I felt would serve him for that particular challenge. It was, it was just something very out there uh, that I was like, oh, I don't know if I can honestly say I've reconciled that with myself yet. And so I think that's the key is like just knowing what, what are your limits? What are your boundaries for yourself as a coach? And I think along the way, I just always wanted to kind of see if I could transcend them. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, I love what you said. And I, and I think it's another reason we get along well is choosing truth over comfort. I love, I love that saying. And, and I think I think it's a good way to go. I mean, at least a good way to grow, um, yeah. you know? Yeah. So Kim, how would you summarize your coaching style? Eclectic, um, unexpected. Uh, I truly feel I have collected a lot of interesting tools. Uh, my, my background is pretty diverse. You know, I have a formal certification from the Coaches Training Institute. Uh, you know, that's an ICF. That's the governing body of coaches. You know, the ICF is the International Coach Federation that kind of puts a credential on your course trainings. And I, and I have all those. But I've also uh, done uh, pretty out there training. Like, you know, I have gone through a shaman uh, training school. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much grounded in reality, but I also have a spiritual bent to myself. And I have had uh, incredible experiences with some spiritual teachers that have allowed me to kind of, in my opinion, be even more uh, beneficial to the clients I work with. So ultimately, what I really have a ability to see is how people hold themselves back, how people stop themselves. I, before every coaching session, I truly, you know, there's, a, there's a, a phrase in Native American tradition that talks about becoming the hollow reed to let spirit or source move through you and that you are like a flute being played by the universe, by God, by spirit. And at the end of the day, what I ask for is that it isn't me really coaching somebody, but that it's source, divine knowledge, divine intelligence will speak through me. And that the tools that I may have collected along the way, that the right one will be used. So I try to go into all my coaching calls as neutral as possible uh, and, and from a place of true curiosity. Um, and I also believe, which I have learned from my training as a coach, to hold the client, every client that I work with is naturally creative, resourceful, and whole. That means they are not broken. They don't need fixing. They actually have all their solutions. But what I hopefully do with my questions is elicit and open up the box to their own solutions to come forth. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Kim, to, I think maybe probably, maybe older school people Maybe not, maybe even like younger people, but they'd be like, oh, spirituality and trading? Like what? Like, no, there's no room for that. What, like, what, would, you, what would you say to people that think that's just a bunch of you know, BS? Yeah, well, what I would say is that we're human beings, not human doings. And that for the most part, every trader who really succeeds, I feel they intuitively know this. I, I think the word spirituality gets a bad rap uh, because there are those out there who are very dogmatic about it. So what I would say is if you, you can find a word that makes you more comfortable, again, it's a label, like who cares? Like w there are people who experience a transcendent moment in a trade, you mm -hmm. know, that is an experience of something bigger than them. That is what we're talking about. We're not talking about a dogma. We're talking about when you feel like you're one with the trade, when you feel like you're one with your ability to see something that's coming before it even is born yet, like on your trading screen. That's you being in sync with the universe, you being in sync with all there is, with all that you've come from, where all you're going. Like that is this 
I, I think it shows up in music. I think it shows up in trading. I think it shows up in poker, Ray, as we talked about before we started recording. I think it shows up in um, sex. I think it shows up in a lot of places in our lives where there's no effort. It's just you're in that flow. And that's what Cheek Semihai's book is all about. How do you get to a flow state? Artists, uh, painters, they're in a flow state. And that kind of, that to me is transcendent of industry. It's, it's a place where it's just uh, seamless. There's a seamless. It, the first thing I think of, and you and I have talked about this too, is fee. You know, the concept of Fibonacci's, uh, you know, that, that concept of fee, it's, it shows up in shells, it shows up in ferns, it shows up in music, it shows up in trading, right? It's that, that to me is where all the juice is. So I, I'm like, hey, how can I get connected to that? Because then it will be effortless. Beautiful. That, that, that was so well said. Jay, I, you know, I, I know you and me have kind of talked about this a little bit and you know obviously you're you're older than me you 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 worked on wall street with some of you know those uh, you know street street types who would be like oh journaling what are we writing poetry well so, so what do you exactly. think i'm gonna come around to this concept a little bit more well here's the thing i've always been fascinated with trading psychology um because i remember reading about uh van k tharp and um he was one of the first guys out there and i never really when you're young, you don't really think about these things because you think you're indestructible, right? Mm. But I can tell you, like, everything that you have been talking about, it's amazing. Um, you know, my whole identity in my life was wrapped around being a trader. After 9-11, when things went horrible, you know, you go from living in a penthouse and having two Porsches to taking the bus, living above an Irish bar. Mm. And, you know, you, you, you know, you look at your wife and she's like, you're like, does this woman still love me? Right. Yeah. Th those things really mess with your head. Right. Yeah, so, um, it, it, I've been there a couple of times I've, you know, and so I built myself up after nine 11 and then only to have, you know, something else bad happen years later, but, and then my health go. So uh -huh. you start to think, um, well, especially when I started retail trading, my biggest problem with being a retail trader was thinking, you know what, do I, I don't deserve to be successful again. Mm, right. Totally. I, I had, I had, you know, two chances. I did well, maybe that's it. Right. Mm. Maybe that, that was my kick at the can. Right. Mm. And, and I felt really bad because my health failed and I failed. I felt like I failed my wife, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just, um, you, you start going, man, do I deserve this? Right. And that was the biggest problem for me. So yeah. I'm keenly aware of how the psychology works. Um, and I, I didn't have the benefit of a therapist or anything. I just, you know, dug inside my head and dug out all the crap. <laughs> and it took That's a while, awesome. you know. Yeah, of but course. But it's, you know, like I'm listening to you. I'm like, you know, I, I'm like, Jesus, I could have used her like, you know, 10 years ago. Where the hell were you when I needed you, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. Because, I was out on the bench outside of the stock exchange. I, I should have been there. I was just... You know, it was just crazy because you have this energy about you where people can't even be in a bad mood around you. So mm -hmm. that, that's a really cool thing. And you mm -hmm. need that in a person. And it's not just, you know, like a, a cheerleading thing, but that energy that lifts a person up and gets them to like actually look up at the sky and still looking up at the ground, down at the ground. Yeah. And that's a big thing in trading because, you know, uh, this business, I mean, I've had 10, 12 friends who have committed suicide. Right. I've, I've, you know, I've yeah. sat with my market maker buddies while they go through rehab, divorce. Yep. Totally. You know, I mean, some of these guys, you're 26 years old, you're making 5 million a month. What do you think they're going to do with it? Right. Totally. So that lifestyle, and then you see how it just comes crashing down. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that, you know, normal people don't have to deal with that. And it's sure it's glamorous and, you know, it was all this money and, and things like that, and you're moving markets, but boy, when it comes falling apart, you know, uh, you look in the, you know, it's like they said in Wall Street, you look in that abyss and nothing's staring you back, yep. you know, and that's, yep. um, that, and, and, I, and I think it's wonderful that people have access to the kind of, um, 
of help that you give now because before that and even you know guys you'd be like you know you, you'd be ashamed to even say that you were um you know you were ashamed to say that you were even looking for help Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Men especially have been so brainwashed and indoctrinated oh, with yeah. a cultural conditioning of not, you know, being a John Wayne, be a man. And yet, mm. you know, I'm a, a big fan of a movie called uh, The Mask You Live In, which is about how, excuse my French, fucked men are by this cultural conditioning and how you guys have all been kind of sold uh, a really, really bunch of misinformation which is you know he at the start of that movie some football coach says the most dangerous words you could ever say to a little boy or to a man is to be a man because there's no explanation about what that means so you, mm -hmm. you start to imagine like what the culture has told you a man is and of course of course, not being uh, somebody connected to their emotions or feelings is part of what is understood. It's like this John Wayne, uh, unemotional rock, basically not a human. And that's, you know, that's why it's so hard to reconcile with the hard to be with feelings in the first place, because you've been taught that you're not supposed to even have them. And, mm -hmm. and the thing about emotions too, JG, I just want to speak to this because of what you said a few minutes ago, you know, the thing about money and why having money without this distinction can be troublesome is money facilitates our ability to get our wants met. And when we get our wants met, wants are not the same as needs. So if you get all of your wants met with when you have a lot of money, you can do that. You can still have a penthouse, a private boat, you know, so on and so forth, and still be unhappy. Why? Because getting wantsman is not the same as needs. And what's the need? Needs can be things like respect, community, uh, freedom, uh, contribution. Most people don't have the distinction between those two things. So you've got, you know, people who have a lot of money, they can get whatever they want. And what I say is when you get your want met, but not your need. It's like eating Chinese takeout. You're not going to be truly nourished. You're going to be hungry an hour it, later. And that is exactly um, so true because I was telling somebody today, I said, there was one point in my life where, you know, my wife and I, we were living in, you know, like an 8,500 square foot house overlooking a cliff, you know, uh, had every car I wanted in the four car garage. Yep. Um, you know, didn't, I could go out, just, you know, drop 20, 30, 50 grand without even thinking about it. And I was miserable. I was, I look, I was, I was looking at the ocean one day and I just, and I was like, Jesus, I did it. But Holy Christ, this is like, this is really lonely. And this really, and I'm like, then you start going, my God, man, what are you thinking? Right. Why are right. you complaining? You've got right. everything you wanted, you know? But you and don't. You have you have everything don't. you wanted, but nothing that you need. And and it go. doesn't it doesn't mean you can't have all that beautiful stuff and yeah. have your needs met. But if you don't know what your needs are, most people don't even know what their own needs are. I mean, I have something I give every client. It's called the Universal Needs List that Marshall Rosenberg created, the Creative Nonviolent Communication. When I got that list, I was like, wait a minute, are you telling me I? these are okay to have, like that it's okay to need freedom to see and be seen, that it's need to, it's, it's okay to have sexual expression. Like, like it was a aha moment for me when somebody gave me that list because I was like, these are human needs. We all have them. And guess what happens when needs are not met? You know what the feelings are? Anger, apathy, depression, frustration, uh, disconnection, oh, yeah. paralyzation. And when those feelings show up, what do we do as a culture right now? Well, we numb them. We numb them through either alcohol, drugs, uh, you know, shopping, gaming, you name trading sometimes. And that's, that's part of the challenge too with trading is I think a lot of times the trading, this is a big part of what I'll do with traders from the beginning is ask them, what needs are you not getting met right now personally? Because if you're not getting your needs met personally in your life or even professionally, you're going to try to get those needs in your trading. I had one woman who was, because of the coronavirus, not 
able to, she loved adventure. So she'd go on these kind of adventurous weekends. She hasn't been able to do that. Guess what was happening to her trading? It was, she was taking risks after risk after, she's like, I never used to take these risks. I'm like, yeah, you're not going to jump out of an airplane anymore because you're <laughs> quarantined. Yeah. So how do we get you start getting your need for adventure met so that you're not trying to get that need met in your trading? And once she starts to do that, everything starts to go back to the way she had been consistent before. But we don't have this language. Where do we, we don't get taught this in school. No. Hey, here are your needs. And some for you, Kim, are non-negotiable. And JJ, your needs are going to be non-negotiable that are different than uh, Ray's. Like if you get that distinction, then you can be a steward of those needs. But if you have no idea they exist, how can you? And then you start to think, oh, I'm spoiled. No, you're not spoiled. You just have all your wants met and none of your needs met. Yeah. That's and, amazing. And I think this was one of the first things we, we talked about, Kim, and you sent me the list. And I think, yeah, that, that was an eye-opening experience. I've never heard of it put in those terms. And I really think it is a game changer. It really is. A, and to protect yourself from those, like you said, if your needs aren't met, you're going to be feeling depressed, apathy, et cetera, et cetera. So this gives you a game plan and it like, oh, okay, if I'm starting to feel depressed, I might, okay, which needs not being met right now? Like what's, what's right. going on here? So I, I thought that was, that was definitely a game changer for sure. It's like an indicator on your dashboard. If your oil light starts to flash, you're, you're not going to say, oh, no, no. I don't, I don't experience the, I have low oil. Who, who would say that? Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> My oil light just needs, I need more oil. So if you're feeling depressed, you're feeling anger, you're feeling paralyzed or, or, you know, kind of just like apathetic, that's a light on your dashboard that you don't have some needs uh, being met. Now you have to find out what those needs are and become somebody who starts to make requests of the other people in your life or of yourself to begin to get some of those needs met. Mm -hmm. And you're not gonna get them met all the time, every single day, nobody is. But you gotta know the ones that are non-negotiable for you. And mine, you know, for one of my non-negotiables is freedom. So I'm really careful with the opportunities that I take because I have to say to myself, am I gonna get, I might be getting a big paycheck, I might get um, publicity, but if my freedom is not met, I know that then I am definitely not going to be feeling so great. So I have to kind of always balance, okay, I know that's a non-negotiable for me. Is that going to be met in this engagement? And if it isn't, I have to really think twice about whether that's a match for me, even if it is a lot of money or a lot of publicity or a lot of whatever, because it's like, ooh, I can't really do so well without that need. Right. And the same with relationships, you know, if, if I would not be well suited to a relationship where, you know, I potentially had to report in every day or something like that, you know, because that would hinder my need for freedom. So because I've done this work on myself, I know what my non-negotiables are. I'm able to be a better steward of them because of that and not wind up, you know, at the end of the day, every human being you encounter all they're trying to do is get their needs met. But most times, because they don't have the language or the fluency in this, they go about it in a very costly way, costly to themselves and to everybody around them. Yeah. And, and the metaphor too, I think I'll just you know, end with is, uh, why do they ask two lifeguards to approach a drowning person in the ocean? Jay, do you know why? Uh, just in case one gets into trouble? If actually the drowning person starts to push down on one of them to get air. Mm, yeah. And we would not call that person who's drowning, you know, a sociopath. We would be like, yeah, he's trying to get oxygen, right? Yeah. So every human need that you have, I have, is oxygen. And if we are pushing down or somebody's pushing down on us, it's not because they are cruel necessarily. It's probably just because they're just trying to get a need met. So it just changes the lens right. on the interaction with the whole world around you. And it also helps you to realize, oh, wow, I better get, you know, I, I liken it to the oxygen mask on the plane. 
the needs, getting needs met is like getting oxygen. You, you really can't live without it. You can't. Yeah. I mean, this is so true. Yeah. I mean, and, and like tying it into trading, I mean, I think this is of the, the utmost importance because, you know, me coming in the morning to trading in a, in a good, healthy mindset it is important to decision making. Uh, if I'm irritated, if I'm in, you're not, I don't think you can perform optimally. I mean, maybe you can perform good, you know, and maybe there's some exceptions, but I think for the average person, no way. I mean, and there's no point to put yourself behind the eight ball. Anyway, Kim, is there any frequent theme, topic, struggle that you find yourself most commonly talking about with your uh, uh, trader clients? Uh, I think probably the inner saboteur, the inner gremlins, being able to uh, tie them down uh, and not have them be the airtime they're always exposed to. Mm -hmm. I think the inner gremlins, inner saboteurs, it's across the board. Um, and I think the other one, if I had to pick one, is that almost every trader takes their trades personally for the good or the bad. And that is not the ideal way to go. It's, it's, it is such an intimate game that I think it's really easy to take it personally. You know, I did good. I did my homework. Like, I know what I'm doing too. Holy shit, I'm a fraud. What am I doing here? Right? <laughs> Those are the two extremes that mm -hmm. I think most are coming from and neither are true. Right. Yeah. Neither are true. Right, right. Yeah, it's, a, it's always somewhere uh, in the middle. And I think that's what can be so confusing about trading. Like, the, I guess this is how the human brain is wired, right? Oh, good trade means I did something good. Bad trade means I did something bad. And it's like, a lot of times, that's not even the case. We're dealing with probabilities here. It's never 100. It's never 0%. Uh, right. But it's a, tough, it's, a tough, it's a tough concept for the human brain to wrap itself around. You know? Absolutely. So, yeah. Because we like the labels. Yeah. You know, we like labeling, you know, I'm, I'm a loser and we like to label, uh, label, I'm a winner, you know, but, but you're really neither. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes your skill is showing up and sometimes luck is showing up or both Yeah. or neither, right. but it's not, you know, and this goes back to even to something Jay said earlier that I wanted to tune in on is the worthiness you know, this is also, I think, what shows up in trading is that our worthiness can't be earned. We are worthy. All human beings are worthy. And Rosenberg says the most dangerous word in the English language is the word deserve, because it implies that somehow we have to earn or that to deserve means you, you have earned worthiness and and the concept is completely incorrect you are just worthy and so part of what i think happens for traders especially traders who are more sophisticated who have been around long enough is there is still somehow this collapsing of their in in you know essence of worthiness with their success and that is, it's like, you know, I don't know if you've ever gotten a dry cleaner, this like cardboard that gets put sometimes in shirts, it's like trying to peel. If you ever try to peel those two cardboard pieces apart, it's almost <laughs> impossible. They've been like glued together. That's what every trader needs to pull apart from. Your worthiness is not collect. It should not be attached to your success or lack thereof because it's, it exists unto itself. So per, if you can, learn how to separate yourself from the belief that somehow you have to earn your worthiness, uh, that would go a long way because yeah. worthiness can't be earned. It's just a, it's just a birthright. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's almost like, a, I would say like a, a, like a radical like concept, uh, in like society, right? It's like, Oh no, you gotta, you, you know, you gotta deserve it. You gotta get, you know, uh, whatever the earn case. It. Earn it. You gotta earn it. You gotta earn it. You know, Kim, like kind of like on this topic is something I struggled with, especially early in my poker career was separating my like who I actually am, like Ray, the person, the human being from Ray, the poker player, because, mm -hmm. you know, it was terrible for people around me. Like if, if I had like a losing day or a losing week, 
like I was not in a good mood. I like, I didn't feel good about myself. I felt like dejected, like, what am I doing? And like, that's not good for my girlfriend. That's not good for my family or, you know, whoever, cause I'm not, I'm not, there. I'm not being myself, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so what, what type of advice uh, do you give to people like, that struggle with this? I think the heart of that is that we, because of the culture that we're in, we, we have been taught that what we do is who we are. Yeah. And so, and, and, and there's something beautiful about loving what you do, right? I know you loved what you did when you were playing poker and I know you love what you're doing now with trading. And there is a part of ourselves that we want to kind of realize that we can never fully inhabit all of that which we do because we're we're so much vast so much more vast than just the doing and that's why i used that phrase before if you realize you're a human being not a human doing that begins to kind of maybe put a little bit of a separation so what what i would say to somebody who's you know it, it's understandable at the beginning of your process because you're identifying all the time with trying to become a better trader you're trying to become somebody who's skilled at this but you have to be very careful around that identifying with that becoming who you are because it will never be who you are it will always be what you do Yes, there is a flow state that maybe you'll be able to access, but only when you really let go of not identifying with that completely. You, you, can, you can lose your identity in that. And, and the key here is that how, do you, how does your identity transcend anything that you do? How, how do you find that part within? And even Campbell talks about this, like there is this place that we all need to visit, like a sacred room, a sacred room within ourselves, a place where we're not what we do, where we're not, you know, the, the political party we associate with, where we're not the, you know, football team that we believe in, where like all that stuff drops away and we're just connected to the essence of who our soul is. And that is the place where then we can be kind of unattached to those labels. But it, but it takes practice and it takes doing some work on yourself because right now, some of those labels are the only thing that people depend on to give them sense of self-worth, you know? And that's why I think it's really hard, especially for men who are in positions, especially in Wall Street with these big fancy titles, you know, when those positions come to a close, even just from retirement, that this is part of why I feel men drop dead after they retire mm -hmm. because they have become so identified with what they do that they don't know who they are outside of that uh, role title. And, and they kind of like, they don't, they don't know who they are if they're, if they're not that. And that's, that's from a lifetime of not ever discovering or, or connecting in the first place to who they are beyond that. Yeah. Jeez, wow. that is that's that's one hundred percent hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> Been there, done that, got the T-shirt. You know, it's just holy. That's just uh, God. Where were you in in two thousand and one? Mm -hmm. I uh, seriously, it was just uh, that is exactly what I went through. My whole identity was wrapped up in it, and yeah. um, and yeah. and you know, it just. It, you and then you just you're just wondering like oh my god what the hell am I gonna do now you know like yeah you know, totally you, know, you just you totally. feel like that sense of failure even though it was 9-11 you know yeah. and yeah. Um, I really didn't do anything my you know my boss uh, got arrested for, by the FBI and right. <laughs> so you know um, you know so even though no fault of your own you're in a wrong place at the wrong time totally. but boy it messes with your psyche because it takes so long to get back and it does, um, it does especially know. if that identity, you know, because of this cultural conditioning that men kind of get put through that, you know, and, and like, let's call it what it is, especially on Wall Street, right? It's the big swinging dick syndrome, right? Yeah. You, you got to be the big swinging dick of the floor, of the company, of the yeah. department, of the team, or yeah. you're not a man. Exactly. And exactly. that there kind was... of brainwashing is, yeah. it's, goes up. It, how does that not affect you? 
<laughs> oh yeah, I mean, there was there was a guy in Vancouver, um, uh, J Bob, and he was a multimillionaire, lost it all, ended up living in the park, and you would still see him on Howe Street, walking around smoking cigars, you know, like like nothing happened. Yep. And you know, I mean, he made his fortune back, but. It, it, you know, just, I remember that. I, I still remember that as a young yeah. person working on the yep. street, yep. you know, always remember um, seeing him, you know, he was like homeless, but you know, <laughs> it, it, it was still his identity. Right? Still, I, was, still his, his identity. Yeah. And, and you guys are not like, I feel like men are not really given an alternative option. Like yeah. it's, it's kind of kill or be killed, like exactly. become the man or not be the man. Like yeah. those are those are just such, you know, you don't have a choice. It's like either I'm going to be ruled over or I have to rule over. And exactly. if you're not given any alternatives, then yeah. how do you find a way to navigate, you know, the schools, the other guys in the office, uh, the guys in your life, you know, like it, mm -hmm. it's, you're kind of fucked either way, excuse my yeah. French. Very true. Yeah. Tim, you're working on a exciting new course geared towards retail traders. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Trading Hero Journey is the name of the course, and there'll be a number of courses available on it. But uh, the one that I'm most excited about is uh, allowing traders to see that they themselves are the heroes of their trading journey and to take uh, all that I've learned from Joseph Campbell's work and his uh, hero journey kind of map, which he, uh, I'll give a shout out to my friend's movie, Finding Joe, the movie.com. Uh, in that, if you're curious who Joseph Campbell is or what the hero's journey model looks like, um, you can watch that and get a, a great overview. Of course, you can always watch The Power of Myth, uh, which is Bill Moyer's interview of Joe Campbell. Uh, and The Power of Myth uh, is the interviews where Joe Campbell talks about the hero's journey. So this is basically for every trader to I feel part of the challenge traders are up against is they don't know uh, what's coming next on their journey. And I hope that this um, is a map that they can kind of find out, like, where am I now on my trading journey and what's to come in the future by way of what, how, how can they kind of like gird their loins for what's next? Uh, so that's my hope is that this course will give them a map of like, okay, this is where I am now and where am I going? I feel part of the challenge is none of us have a map. You know, if we had a map, then, you know, whenever we're lost in a, in a new place, what helps is a map. So I hope this gives uh, traders a map and also to perhaps see themselves as the heroes of their own journey. I think a lot of young and new traders especially are looking outside of themselves uh, to find like, oh, well, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? You know, I see this in the chat rooms, like, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? I, I hope that once you're past the beginning stages of being a newbie, you start to not ask other people what they think, but you start to look within yourself. What do you think? You know, have you done the homework? Have you done the studying? Have you done the work? Are, are you now ready to listen to your own inner voice? Are you now disciplined enough to be true to what you think of something? That's the place you ultimately have to get to. So I hope this course will do that for them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, you know, you know, some, I guess just speaking from personal experience, Kim, it, listen, you know, I guess it was easier for me once I started trading because I've had experience with poker and I think like poker, and I speak about this all the time, but poker really prepared me even more so than I thought for trading uh, initially. But I, um, I had a hard time um, for a while just listening to my inner voice. I would think, I would, let's say I'm like playing a poker hand, right? And I'd be thinking about, oh, well, how would this player play it? You know, I'd be thinking about one of the best players in the world. I'm like, how would he play this right now? And I had to, I had to do that reprogramming myself and but it, it's a hard thing because you got to have that confidence too you got to have that like that's like a leap of faith yeah. like no no i know what i'm doing no no, no yeah. i know how to do it um so i don't know it took experience or just i guess some time for me i mean do you, would you say that's like the um, most prevalent for people is, is there ways to help cultivate that you know that inner reliance it, it's, a, it's a great question, and, I, and it's a, I'm going to give kind of a tricky answer. In the beginning, you do need to be questioning yeah. whether your choices are based in uh, your 
experience and your studies like a spec and and it's and in a way that's something nobody can tell us we have to know when are we ready to not ask ourselves how would ray do it or how would this person that is my teacher do it you do have to come to this place where you do start to listen to your own voice but that is a tricky moment that is sort of undefined for everybody you know if you think about Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, you know, he's in the training sessions with Yoda, you know, and there's this great scene where at the beginning of his training, where he says to Yoda, you know, I'm not afraid, you know, and Yoda says, oh, you will be, <laughs> you will be. Like, he's like, oh, he's all bravado. Like, I'm not afraid. I can handle this. And until he gets to that place where he's like, oh shit, maybe I can't handle this. That is the moment when he actually becomes ready to handle it. Mm, right. So it's, it's sort of this counterintuitive place of like, are you still saying to yourself, I need to think about what my teacher or what, my, what this person I admire does. And then this place when you realize, okay, I have to stand on my own two feet now and take ownership, not blame, ownership of this choice. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, like just thinking back on my experience. Yeah. I think it, there was just, just a moment. Well, I don't know if it, I, I can't think of like a specific moment, but I just think mm -hmm. it just gradually came. Like I would have bursts, you know, then maybe revert back to the yeah, old man. way, but then eventually it's like anything else, right? Then eventually, okay. Then that just becomes the norm. It just becomes visceral. One step heart. forward, two steps back. Right. right. What, what happens at the karate kid wax on wax off. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. it, and that, and that's part of becoming uh, experienced at anything. There, there is a beginning phase. There is a, you know, and I, I think it takes years. So like two years in, you're still in the beginning, you know, three yeah. years in, you're still a beginner. You know, I mean, there's a lot to learn. It's also what the most competitive game in the world that ever ends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, give yourself a minute. Right. Yeah, exactly. No, no, exactly. Right. And I think people, you know, uh, and I, I think you would agree with me too, Kim. I think people like, like you're saying, people have to expect, right. Or they know what, or have a path. Right. But then also at the same time, not have expectations. Right. Cause I think having expectations, a lot of that's what messes a lot of people up. They think like, Oh, I'm going to make X amount of day, or I'm going to be profitable by this date. And I think that's very, I think it's just bad to do. I think people are setting themselves up for failure doing that. Would you, Absolutely. would you agree? Yeah. I, I would. And, and then God forbid, let's say that happens and they do have the luck on their side and they get lucky, then that's going to unfortunately probably hinder the rest of their trading career because they'll think that they had it all figured out when really they just got lucky. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So Kim, tell us about your book and uh, the motivation behind it. Yeah. Here's my book. All right. My baby, Transforming Wall Street, A Conscious Path for a New Future. Uh, this book oh, just about killed me. It really did. I just had a couple of moments with this one. It's just, talk about inner gremlins. All of my freaking busload of inner gremlins were like in my head, like a lot. Because I interviewed some very famous people. And I was just so petrified. They'd all come at me if I misquoted them or if there was a mistake I missed. I, I developed a nervous tick at the end of the process of the book, by the way, JJ. That, that wow. you don't want to have in any book writing, trust me. Wow. <laughs> like, literally no, I just, I, I don't have any, like, I just, when I just write, it's just about my experiences and they're so crazy that I'll just sit back and go, oh my God, how did I survive that one? You know? <laughs> It's like, oh, I lived. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> I lived. That, that's like win. That's one for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this was, you know, I interviewed 90 people in my book. So I was just really wanting to make sure that everything they said, you know, of course I did a transcript of what everybody said, but just weaving it together. Um, so it features what I call the Wall Street 50, uh, men and women who succeeded in finance with their integrity to show... Uh, all the Occupy Wall Street people at the time uh, that was happening in New York. Cause you know, I did free coaching down outside the stock exchange for a year. Mm -hmm. As that year came to a close, Occupy started. And there was a bunch of young people, you know, in this 
little park all yelling about capitalism. And I was like, okay, the enemy folks is not capitalism. The enemy is corruption. You know, when you sell your own clients crap, that's not capitalism people. That's called stealing, you know, lying. And I just kind of felt like the young people were collapsing capitalism with corruption. We were only hearing about the bad guys. We were hearing at the time about Bernie Madoff, right? The Ponzi scheme of Ponzi schemes. And I really thought, oh, wow, young people are misunderstanding this to be capitalism. So I felt somebody needed to show them the men and women who had succeeded with integrity and show them that capitalism actually was a good thing when done consciously, when done with integrity. So I thought, you know, if I, I, I remember at the time saying, you know, could somebody find the good men and women of Wall Street and let them be interviewed about the solutions we needed? Nobody took me up on the idea. And at some point I walked past uh, a famous bookstore downtown in New York City called The Strand. And there was a mm. Toni Morrison quote in the window. Damn it. And it said, uh, if there's a book you want to read and it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And it just like poof, went right through my heart like a spear. Wow. I was like, shit, I gotta write <laughs> this goddamn book. What the hell? <laughs> I was just like, it just felt like a slap in the face. And I was like, I never wrote a book before. I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to do this? And then before I knew it, I just started getting all these introductions to conscious capitalists in Wall Street. And I started reaching out to some famous players that I thought, they'll never say yes to me. I'm not a reporter. I'm not a professional writer. Like, And they all said yes. I was like, oh, shit. Now I really got to do this. No, you got to do it. And now, so, so I get the interviews done. And then I got to put it all together. And I also wrap it around my five practices. Uh, so the five practices that show up in my coaching that I strive to practice in my own life uh, are these five. And I'm going to say them because they are so important, I think, for all of us in our journeys. The first one is self-responsibility. The second practice is self and other empathy which is a little bit about what the nonviolent communication has taught me. Uh, practice three is uh, emotional non-resistance, emotional connection, learning how to be with hard to be with feelings, which most of us have not ever been taught how to navigate. Practice four is embracing your hero's journey, realizing you are the hero of your life, of your trading, of everything you encounter. And practice five is mindfulness, how to be able to be uh, present to this moment now. And what I discovered after all these interviews was that every one of these 50 uh, conscious, you know, Wall Streeters were practicing one of these five or more of these, one of more of these five practices, not necessarily calling it what I called it, but I saw evidence of it. And that was like the aha moment for me when I was preparing for the book was like, what do they have in common? Well, what they have in common is the fact that they uh, are practicing, you know, these practices. And that was like a beautiful, you know, moment for me because I was like, okay, that's that's how the book can be put together now. You know, all these dispersed, you know, there's so many divergent uh, interviews and stories. But uh, yeah, so it also talks about like how you can withstand the temptation, like what happens when there's a lot of money at stake and you have uh, being asked to compromise your integrity. Like, how do you handle those kind of moments? I, I'm always fascinated by that. Uh, so. And years ago, I read a book called On Conscience and Courage, which was a book about a woman, Ava Folkman's uh, family had been harbored uh, during the Nazi occupation. And she wound up doing a book about all these farmers and you know people who basically put their own family's lives at risk to harbor and save uh, Jewish families that were fleeing. And she knew that like, she would not be here today if, that, if her grandparents had not been harbored. And she was like, what kind of people had the guts, the balls to hide us and protect us or my grandparents or my ancestors? And she was looking at the kind of moral dilemma that she was curious, like, what were they made of that they were able to have that kind of courage? Uh, and so I think that book impacted me early in my life. So I think I was looking kind of like who, you know, obviously a very dramatically different kind of scenario, but how do people stay true to their own souls in the middle of a crisis? And that's what I was kind of fascinated by.
So that's a long answer to your question. I'm sorry. No, no, that's amazing. For the listeners and myself, what was the name of that book again that you just mentioned? Uh, on, of Conscience and Courage by Ava Fogelman. Okay, Of Conscience and Courage. And also for the listeners, they can get your book, Amazon, your website. Yes. It's, a, it's on Amazon as a hardcover and it's also a Kindle on Amazon. And hopefully in the next few months, it'll be available as an audio I have an audio production company finishing right. it up now. So right. that's good. Yeah. All I'm right. not reading it because I wasn't in New York for the reading, but the man, the man who reads it has a really great voice. So. Okay. Awesome. I, I always, I always thought JJ would be a good. Uh, yeah. JJ, you reader, have a good right? voice. He's got a, you have a radio voice. You definitely <laughs> have a good deep radio voice. I used to listen to WBAB, uh, which was a radio station on Long Island. And there, there was a DJ whose voice you, rem you remind me of, actually. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, JJ, your, your father was a radio DJ, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Back in, in Sri Lanka, yeah. It was wow. pretty weird. Yeah, strange. Wow. Yeah. Maybe he just picked it up subconsciously, you know? Like, Maybe yeah. I did. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or you just have that smooth, it's like a smooth, you know, do you guys like Chris Voss, the negotiation expert? Uh, I've, I've never, never. Yeah, no, no, I'm not aware of him. No. So, check so out. he's pretty, pretty amazing. His book, his book is called Never Split the Difference, uh, co-written by a good friend of mine, uh, Tal Roz. And he talks about one of the negotiation styles is called the late night FM DJ voice. So when you're actually trying to negotiate with somebody, there's a time and a place to put on your late night FM DJ voice. JJ, you already speak that way, so you would to be able to negotiate anything. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I like that, though. I, I like that. Wow. Okay. Neat. Because it slows people down. People feel safe. When you, right. you, you get to, if you listen to, I've, I've read his book, listened to his book, and taken his master class. I'm actually in a group with other people who are practicing the black swan technique. Can't say enough about his work. And it's actually, whether he speaks to it or not, he doesn't really speak to it, but I see evidence of nonviolent communication in his negotiation technique style. And and um, one of the things he taught, he speaks when he does the audio, he, he drops his voice into that when he's speaking to a hostage in a hostage negotiation, he shifts his voice and you hear how he talks to the person who's taken somebody hostage and the late night FM DJ voice, it, <laughs> everything slows down. You start to feel safe and you can hear that voice has a, a biological, physiological effect on our entire, because, you know, any negotiated negotiation with a hostage, like that guy's all hopped up, right? He's scared mm -hmm. shitless too. Yeah. So he's got to like calm him down and make him also feel safe at the same time so that there can be a negotiation. Um, so anyway, yeah, amazing book, amazing information there. But Jay, you were just you would kill it probably because you have that smooth voice. <laughs> Kim, I, I had the pleasure of being a guest on your podcast. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that and, and also how you got linked up with those guys. You know, uh, Tim Bowen and Steven Johnson, shout out to the two, my two co-hosts on the Steady Trade podcast. They uh, got introduced to me, I guess, May of last year by Glenn Osland, uh, who was their producer at the time. He had met me here in Hawaii. I gave a, a workshop for Alan Cohen, uh, a teacher here that is just, he's an amazing man. And he has me speak usually every year to those coaches that he's training who are you know, becoming certified. So I was at this workshop that Glenn was at with his girlfriend and he heard me speak and he thought I had some things to say that he thought his, uh, you know, uh, Tim and Steven would like. So they brought me on initially as a guest. Uh, and that is episode 100. If you guys want to see the first episode of me being on steady trade, it was a really fun interview. And we just, you know how we just, we just gelled right away. Tim, Steven, and I we just clicked and then they had me back on like 10 times. <laughs> and at some point they were like, you know what? We want you to be our co-host too. And I was like, 
oh my God, I'm so excited because I really like them both. They're both so authentic, so humble. They both really want to be a contribution uh, to their members. Uh, they, they come from, you know, I'm all about integrity, right? And trying to come from a place of being a contribution. They both really come from that place too. So I think that's part of what, why we hit it off. So yeah, we have a lot of fun. I mean, we just, we talked to some really interesting guests. I've, you know, been fortunate to bring on some people that I've known all over the years that I thought would be a contribution to the, to that. And, you know, I, that's how I found you, Ray, because I was, I was looking for guests to bring on the show. And uh, I just thought your story was so fascinating. And Steven Johnson actually had talked about you. So yeah, I'm always, you know, looking on the lookout. And I think people, ultimately need to see, especially traders, they need to see uh, people on different legs of the journey. So, you know, there's, there's just different levels of this journey. And I think it helps to see people on all the different levels. And I love that your poker background, I can, I completely, you know, thanks for the recommendation that you told me to ch check out The Biggest Bluff. I've been devouring that book. Um, I think you are absolutely dead on. In fact, you know, hopefully you're going to teach me how to play poker, that your poker background absolutely has benefited you as a trader. I think it's incredible uh, training ground for anybody who wants to be a trader. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And, and, you know, like I said, it's, I think I've even underestimated how much it prepared me because of the book. It, it's the biggest bluff, by the way, for the listeners, mm. written by uh, Maria Kornikova. Um, and she's, she's not, and, and I like her perspective because she's not a poker player or a, a career poker player. She's a writer, um, very educated person who went under this journey to learn more about the the role luck in skill play in people's uh, lives and she's like it, right Kim she's learning so many things about herself totally uh, in her uh, about her you know who she is as a person using poker as a means for self-discovery yeah. and it was even interesting Kim you know a few episodes back we had on um, a high stakes poker player who's also involved a little bit in trading and he said the oh. same thing and he said the same thing and, and I'm asking him questions too and he's he can't even explain some of them because it's so visceral to him now. It's just like who he is. And he's like, great. I can't even like, this is, I just feel like this is how I've always been. And I'm like, I, yeah. I think it's just years and years of poker, you know? Totally. So definitely totally. a great book. And I definitely recommend for anyone. And Kim, yeah. yes, I would love to teach you poker. Don't, don't, don't take the master class. So yeah, I'll take care of you. Okay, I will. I will do that. I will do that. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited. I, I'm blown away by the book. And I, I have, I, I told you earlier, I printed up like three pages of notes that I've highlighted in the book. And you know what I'm going to be, this is for all my trading clients because yeah. she speaks, she, you replace the word poker with trading. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same, same thing. thing. Same exact same thing. thing. Right, right. So it's a, it's a book about her playing poker, but yeah, just replace trading. Replace your trading, it's 100% applicable. And yeah, I, I think it would benefit anyone, even if you're real experienced. Yes. I think this this benefits you. Um, yeah, just a great read. All right, Kim, some miscellaneous questions now. Okay. Get some fun part. Okay. Living in New York City, you're from New York. Yeah. In Hawaii now. Big difference. Get, give me, just give me a sense of uh, how big of a cultural uh, shock maybe it was for you and how have you adapted? Uh, you know, I'm a real New Yorker. I move fast. I talk fast. I like fashion. I like high heels. Yeah. Uh, I don't even like country music. Um, now I live in a ranch community of uh, 8,000 people, maybe. Um, the fanciest store we have on the island is Target, and that's an hour and a half drive for me. So <laughs> this, and you know what time I go to bed now? like sometimes 8.39 if I'm paddling on the ocean at 6 a.m. the next day. So let me tell you, talk about night and day. I did not see this coming. Uh, this is a total, total unexpected development. But there was some, I came, you know, I, so the, the book brought me here because I have a friend who lives here. He heard about a house sitting gig. He just happened to let me know about it, not because he thought I'd be interested because I had a beautiful, you know, kind of, I had the most beautiful apartment in Brooklyn you've ever seen in your life. It was all glass walls. Like it was just gorgeous. It was like Barbie penthouse. The elevator <laughs> opened up into the apartment. I nice. always wanted that. Always That's wanted so cool. that. It was that so cool. cool. And 
yet. I knew this book had to be written. And so this friend said, hey, there's a house sitting gig. And I thought, oh God, I do have to get out of New York to get this book together, you know, and just to stop being, I couldn't hustle for business and write the book. Like something was going to have to give. So I thought, okay, how do I reduce my expenses every month? And so I house sat in Hawaii and I came and in the end house sat for a year and a half, took me a year and a half to write the book, year and a half of interviews, year and a half to write the book. So I got here, I started to house it. Most of my clients in New York, very, very lucky me because I had wonderful clients. They all agreed to coach virtually. So I've been doing Zoom for like, you know, five years now. Mm -hmm. um, they started to coach with me virtually. I started to write the book here. Uh, and finished the book and went back to New York. But then what happened is I was smiling at people on the subway and I was walking up the subway stairs, not quite fast enough, enough that guys would pass me going, huh. and I was like, oh shit, I've lost my New York City hustle. <laughs> and then I'm like, do I want to stop smiling at people? I'm not sure about that. Do I want to run up the stairs in my high heels? I'm not sure about that. And then the people I house that force, Kim, can you Kim, can you come back for two months? And I was like, okay, I come back. And while I was here, I was at a luau, which is at the Kauai High Canoe Club, which is a canoe club I belong to now and did then. I was, you know, paddling with them. It's six man outrigger canoe. And Lido Archangel was a musician playing, and he invited up 10 young little boys to do the hula. Uh, hula is a sacred art form here. Most mainlanders think it's just for women, but it's actually men can also do hula. And so these little boys get up. Lito is playing a Hawaiian song called Pua Olena, which you can Google. Mm. And I couldn't find my friends. I'm sitting with my plate of food. You know, Auntie Eunice is cooking. If any elder is called Auntie or Uncle here. Exactly. And I was sitting by myself, and he starts to play this song, and I not cry, but I start to sob and weep and just, I, 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 I'm not, I just can't even tell you what came over me. And I remember asking myself, am I having a breakdown? Like I thought I was having a breakdown. And then I swear that I heard the island say, you're not having a breakdown. You're just happy you're home. And literally uh, my response was, this cannot be my home. <laughs> my company is the Wall Street coach, okay? <laughs> I'm single and there are no men on this island. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, I was like, this is not my home. Uh, and the island just said, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. This is your home. And I was like, oh shit, this is my home. And that was it. It was like, you know, falling in love with the wrong person. I fell in love with the island and I had no choice left. It was like, this was home. And a Brook I'm Brooklyn born. Like no, <laughs> nothing was ever going to replace home but Brooklyn or Manhattan. But this just suddenly became home. And I couldn't, I thought, what would I say to a client right now? I was like, I got to walk this talk, right? It feels like home. I got to listen to that in my heart. So here I am in this, you know, country town but you know what i got my wall street station so we said, <laughs> i got i got my grand central painting nice, nice. i got i got my i got my atlas over there from fifth avenue rock center Beautiful. like i got another one of the MetLife building which is where i used to work on the 40th yeah. floor on the other wall like i meet a little new york city grand central here for myself even <laughs> though i have cowboys and you know horses outside and cows and chickens i'm surprised no chicken is you know roosters screwed this podcast up today they're always out that window that, 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 that's what i was going to bring up when during one of our sessions i uh, kept getting interrupted by a rooster and i'm like kim what the hell is that noise oh he's like there's a rooster like i don't know where it went downstairs or outside i don't know so totally totally but let me just say this just a shout out to my favorite store in the world that this is always still very close close at hand by Bloomingdale's credit card. That's like as close as I get to New York. I just like call Bloomingdale's for a while and get a little fix on, so. There you go. Shout out to Bloomingdale's. Exactly. <laughs> JJ, what, what, what have you thought about, I know you spent some time in New York, you lived in Hawaii for a little bit. What, what stood out to you? Oh, he just Sorry. muted him. There you are. Yeah, I'm back. The, the moose must have hit the power pole up here. 
He's, he's in Saskatchewan, Kim. In, uh, wow. Yeah, so yes, he's up there. Did, I, I don't know if, did you hear my question, Jay? No, what, it, what was it? I, I was asking, um, you've spent some time in New York. You've lived in Hawaii. I, I was going to ask you what, what are your thoughts or your thing to pretty spot on what Kim said. Oh, man, Hawaii is, is, is the place. You know, I, I love New York. New York is, is like my second home. But I have family in Hawaii, and uh, the music you're talking about, my auntie, <laughs> my auntie Ruthie, uh, she's she was related to Dennis uh, Kamakahi. Really? And, yeah. And when I hear uh, Wahine like yeah, hey, I'm getting choked up right now. <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's a visceral, emotional, heart opening experience. There's just no way you can. You cannot be touched and moved by it. It's so, uh, it's so authentic and genuine and vulnerable. There's a vulnerability here. There's an innocence in Hawaii. I'm not saying naive at all. No, I'm just saying no. there's an innocence, a kindness, a soft. There's aloha. It's aloha. Exactly. That, it's that's, aloha. That spirit of aloha. Yeah. The people yeah. are just amazing. Amazing, amazing. And, and it's been, you know, I think so humbling for me because, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't fortunate enough to have, uh, you know, I, because of just the journey I've had, I, I didn't really have like the aunties, the uncles, if you will, but I have them now. Like my yeah. uncle Manny Vincent is my canoe coach, uh, mm. you know, paddling coach. And my experience with him is like, you know, like a grandfather or an uncle, like, the reverence of how he mm. sees his paddling, like it's sacred. It's passed on it generation after generation. Oh, so he's probably sense, a water man, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's total water man. Yeah. Uh, he, he's just, uh, and he's a rancher, you know, like, and the youthfulness, like he's 87 <laughs> going on 37. Like he's unstoppable. You know, one of my but, closest friends is 87 and she's out on the water all the time. Exactly. My, my aunt's father, he was surfing at, until his 80s, you know. Um, I believe it. And I, yeah, believe I it. think, yeah, that um, they just envelop you in, in, that, in that ohana, you know, in that family. They do. It's wonderful. Yeah. They do. It's, it's you know, and, and I think for me, I was lucky to have some guidance, you know, David and Bobby, my initial host, when I decided to move here, you know, I'd come over to their house and uh, they'd have a Mai Tai ready for me and be <laughs> like him. You got to bring it down. <laughs> yeah. oh, I you got to bring it down and dial it back. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? I don't know. You know? And they were just like, got to bring it down. I was like, S okay. Sister. 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 Right? Sister. <laughs> like, he's like, two, two warnings. Never honk your horn. Never pass on the right. I'm like, exactly. but if they're stopped and they're making a exactly. left, why can't I pass on the right? Because you yeah. don't do that here. Yeah, you let yeah, them just, go and you yeah. wait. Wait? Exactly. I don't yeah. wait for anything. <laughs> you better get used to it, sister. Oh, yeah. Sister. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny, Kim. Uh, you know, JJ, you know, he, he's got a lot of stories. You know, me, me and him talking, he, he always he always would bring up the fact that when uh, he's living in Vancouver, JJ, your, your wife was from the East Coast, right? and <laughs> just how right. she would like uh people would just like say hi to her and she would just be like what the hell do these people want you know like like <laughs> <laughs> and just her whole mentality like east coast versus, oh yeah uh, i just find that funny oh, too what's your problem <laughs> yeah, she'd be like you know they'd be like hi and she'd be like well yeah they're just like what the hell do you want what the exactly. you want? there's like like this guy's gonna rob me i'm like no 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 it's just people are just you know friendly here <laughs> You know, it's, exactly. it's chill out. It's it's the West Coast. You know, it's everyone's every first of all, everyone's stoned, so they're just yeah. like you know, they're just you know, the worst totally. thing they're gonna do is see if you have a candy bar on you. You know, that's all. <laughs> it takes them getting used to though, because once once you wind up kind of coming from like it, it it's it's a transition. You have to transition into that. And when I was smiling at people on the subway, you know, it I I get these looks, and then I was like, why why are they giving me that look? So I'm like, oh my god, I'm smiling. Like yeah. I forgot that I'm not in Hawaii when I first, yeah. you know. So you, you you just I I just found myself wanting to smile and not not smile anymore. 
And, you know, I love New York too. I'm not dissing New York at all, but no, it's, no. you know, you're not going to last long if you're smiling at people every day on the subway. It's just not going to go well. So you got to, <laughs> yeah, you got to put on your New York armor, you know? That's true. Get, but you know, the, uh, the weird thing about New York is yeah. when I've been there and I've spent a lot of time there, I've met people, there's something magical about that place too, because I've met people in Times Square that were strangers who are still friends now. Totally. You know? I, and, I have too, JJ. Not in Times Square at the Lower East Side, but I'm yeah. with you. I, yeah. I think New Yorkers are the best, but, but yeah. they definitely don't suffer fools easily. And, you, and there has to be that break of the armor. Like a stranger smiling at you is not, but if you're like, as soon as you ask directions, you're golden because yeah. every New Yorker wants to help. That tells me we have, New Yorkers have a good heart. But, yeah, but you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's like almost like a bad rap, I think. It, it's just the different environment. And like you said, the, the, the fools, or however you phrased it, I thought that was a good phrase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, they don't suffer fools easily. Right. You know, but it's also you have, you know, you're in subways with people's heads close to your mat. Like <laughs> when you're in a <laughs> confined yeah. space, you've got to keep your eyes to yourself. You know, you got people are just trying to find their own privacy of space because you're all crammed together all the time. Yeah, true. You know, yeah. it's 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 a little doggy dog, but but once you know. But, but it is, it's, it's the greatest city in the world and I love it forever. And, you know, for whatever reason, I was called to be in Hawaii and I just uh, kind of had to say yes. There was just not, no saying no, but it's also helped me in my own path. And I believe I'm a better coach now for being here because it's helped me uh, be more, practice the being instead of the doing. And the, and the irony is the more that I be, and the less that I do, the better my business is. The more business comes in, the more opportunities, which is so counterintuitive. But I've seen it again and again, mm -hmm. you know? Well, a lot, yeah, I think that's what a lot of things in life, I think, are counterintuitive. You know, just, just think of me as a parent, right? Like they say, like, always the strictest parents, right, have wild children, right? And it's like, the, the you don't, um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, a lot of counterintuitive things, I think, out there. For sure. Kim, you mentioned canoeing, I believe. Yeah, you canoe. What other? Pa paddling. Oh, paddling. 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 Sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the uh, all right. those activities. Right. <laughs> I, I just hang out in the lagoon with my floaty, you know? <laughs> totally. <Wouldn't drink>. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what, what uh, uh, hobbies and interests uh, do you, you have as well? Outrigger paddling uh, was not something I could have ever imagined myself doing. But when I first got introduced to the, this canoe club and went out on the ocean, you're out with five other people in a six-man canoe. Uh, it's something that's the same as it's been for thousands of years in Hawaii. It's how uh, Hawaiians actually, you know, kind of fed their families. They would visit, you know, with each other, different parts of the island. It goes way back. Uh, it's an art form. Uh, you paddle 12, so 12 times on one side, and then you swap over to the other side. You have to be in complete harmony with the person, uh, two people in front of you. And uh, to feel that canoe out on the ocean really move fast when you're all in sync is a feeling unlike any that I've ever had before. Plus in Hawaii, we're very fortunate. We have dolphins out there and manta rays and whales in you know a couple of months, there'll be very huge whales uh, that you'll get to experience if you're lucky enough in your canoe. So it just, you know, plus that the Hawaii Island has five mountains, Mauna Kea being the largest, uh, to be out of the ocean, to have this encounter with these sea creatures to see the mountains and the sun rising you know some we've gone out one of the crews i went out used to go out at 5 a.m uh nothing like keeping you really humble and remembering like how small your problems are when you're out there in nature it's just the it's the most incredible moving meditation i've ever been fortunate to have it just makes you connect to the ocean how we're really just, you know, one planet and uh, there's no talking in the canoe. You know, the famous phrase is shut up and paddle. You know, nobody <laughs> wants to hear you talk out there. So, um, 
Yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful, incredible. So it's like a meditation for me, also exercise and just a way of kind of reconnecting to what's really important, you know? So yeah, it's a magical thing. I feel lucky to have it. Awesome. awesome. All right, Kim, if you were on death row, what would your last meal be? Hmm. It would be tricky to pick, but I'd probably pick this pizza place from the Lower East Side where they made unbelievable, and they give, I get uh, pepperoni, it was pepperoni and black olives and the best cheese and the thinnest crust I've ever had. It would probably, it would probably be that or uh, of uh, Four Seasons restaurant, uh, you know, seven course meal one or the other mm -hmm. <laughs> whichever one was available <laughs> whatever was available is it with that that would be your go-to pizza huh pepperoni black olive yeah like at it. least at this pizza place this pizza place just killed it it was like a hole in the wall but they just used really good cheese uh and it was just my favorite pizza place in new york city i don't even remember the name of it i mean it was yeah. just i don't even know if it had a name it probably didn't have a name <laughs> it was just like i think it was on seventh and first avenue Seventh mm -hmm. or Eighth Street and First Avenue. Okay. Yeah. This is yeah. really good pizza. So, I really been thinking about that place because I haven't had a slice in like five <laughs> years, and I'm like, God, I just want a really good slice of pizza. That, that, that's what I was about to ask you. Like the 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 pizza out there. I don't know. I don't know how's it. No, we don't have New York water. I mean, the reason New York's water uh, bagels and pizza is so good is because of the watershed. That watershed in New York is the secret sauce to every chef in Manhattan, I think. It's the water. We have the best water probably anywhere in the country. I've never had water so good. So, yeah. yeah. No, I yeah. agree. I mean, bagels, too. Is the bagels? Oh, my God. Oh, God. They don't compare nowhere else, neither. Tall bagels. A flat everything with vegetable cream cheese. That was my go-to bagel at Tall Bagels. I miss those too. Yeah. And now, now you have to have uh, Loco Moco. I uh, know. I do have Loco Moco, but it's still hard to eat, Jay. I'm not a Loco Moco girl. I no? try. No, I'm oh, not. Okay. I don't. The gravy, it's just too much. Too much. <laughs> too much. The and, gravy and, on top of your egg and the rice and the spam. I've had more spam you, in my entire I was, career. I was, you know. I was going to ask, how's the spam? Oh because god. everybody, the spam, oh my god. They like uh, their spam here. They oh like yeah. their spam. There's entire end caps of the different flavors of spam. There are oh. Mac nuts here that yeah. have spam flavoring over them. Yep. What yep. the hell? I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's... <laughs> All right, and I, I guess with that, uh, that'll conclude today's episode. Of <laughs> on spam? We're going to add on spam? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's getting a little weird now. We're talking about spam. I'm like, all right, let's wrap this up. Oh. <laughs> uh, if you guys enjoyed the show, please rate and review it for us. If you guys want to learn market auction theory, market profile, trade futures, trade equities, options, join DJ and I at microefutures.com. Tim, tell the people where they can find you. Anything else you want them to know? On the big island for Hawaii. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> on the wallstreetcoach.com uh, and Kim and Curtin on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, all that good stuff. All right, good stuff. Good JJ, stuff. pardon words. Uh, Kim, uh, mahalo, mahalo and much mm -hmm. aloha. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. It was, uh, it was wonderful having you on the show and we just, uh, please come back and come visit us in the trading room. Okay. Uh, you're just you're just an amazing energy. We'd love to you know just uh -huh. come hang out with us whenever you Thank want. Thank you. I will. I will come and mahalo nui loa to all of both of you for having me on Ray and Jay. It's so nice to get to know you today. So thank you. Thanks for letting me be here. This was such a long conversation. You guys are giving me so much time to you know share some of what I've learned along the way. It was really very special to be here. I had a great time, a really good time. Yes, the the, the feeling is mutual and. The, the conversation I thought was so great. It, it transcended trading, but it was about trading at the same time. I, I thought it was great, Kim. So just thank you so much for your time. So for Kim and Curtin, I'm Paulie Walnuts. He's the girl on House Street. You stop, though. So. <laughs>
Thank you, guys. That was such a blast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, Ken. Uh, thank that you. That was 